Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this IRP webinar, Professional Learning Through a Restorative Lens. It's so great to have so many people joining us from all around the world. I invite you as you join to go into the chat room and uh, feel free to let us know where you're coming from and you may use the chat room throughout the webinar. If you have specific questions that you'd like to ask, that's the question and answer area. So if you're, um, uh, if you've posted where you're from in the question and answer area, you might want to also go over to the chat room and do that and try to reserve the question and answer for um, questions. Uh, I'm asked, is everyone muted? And I just want everyone to know that all participants will be muted throughout the call. So you don't have to worry about that. You're not visible or um, your audio is not on. So um, let's get started. My name is Josh Wachtel. I'm the IRP communication specialist. I'm joined today by IIRP lecturer Beth Small and director of student services Jamie Keynes. And we're really excited to be talking about a topic that I think doesn't always get enough attention in the restorative world, but it's really, really important to how the IIRP and many of the people that we work with conceive restorative practices as a means of learning. And many of the processes, obviously we know that restorative practices is used very much in education specifically, but even more so in general, we think of the processes of restorative practices and even restorative justice as fundamentally learning processes. Things happen, people get together, uh, we respond to each other, we listen to each other, we ask questions of each other, and we learn. And so this, we're going to try to put this in a really general context today that I think is going to be applicable for everybody, regardless of what your particular professional area is. Um, so, but let's start with that. We have a poll. Can we bring up the poll? Um, what is your professional field? Just so we can get an idea of where people are coming from that would be really helpful to us. So you'll have a minute to, uh, to poll in and then we'll let you know where that all stands. Oh, you can see it as it goes, great. Um, so as I've said, if you're joining late, please feel free to chat in the chat room uh, where you're from. And we will be answering questions, particularly uh, towards the end of the session. Um, so if you have specific questions for any of the hosts, please type your questions there. I believe there's also an ability to upvote questions. So as we go, if you want to review the questions, if you want to put an extra like for any of those questions, we'll know that um, that's of interest to you because if we get a lot of questions, we may or may not be able to get through them all, but we'll try our best. Um, all right, so let's see how this poll is coming out. So it looks like about 73% are educators. We have 5% social services, 7% justice. Great, 6% mental health and counseling. We, oh, we do have one lawyer or legal person that's not registering as a percent, but welcome. 3% uh, in conflict resolution, 3% in community work. Great, and it looks like some exec couple people in executive leadership and 12 identifying as other. That's great. Well, we, as I said at the beginning, I'm hopeful that this topic will be really widely applicable um, to you, no matter what your um, area is. But uh, we are going to start with education. Um, I'm going to do the first presentation um, about my work particularly over the last 10 years at um, an organization called North Star Self-Directed Learning. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, for teens, which is based in Western Massachusetts. Um, I uh, am the communication specialist for the IRP and have been working with the IRP for about 15 years. But I, before that and concurrent with that, spent about 25 years teaching in a lot of different contexts. Um, 
And most recently, I was a teacher and an advisor at North Star Self-Directed Learning for Teens. Now, this is a somewhat unconventional learning place. It's, it's specifically not a school, or at least it sees itself as not a school, though it works with about 60 uh, teenagers at, at any given time who do attend. Um, but they attend on a voluntary basis. Uh, there's no degrees or graduation or grades or anything like that. Uh, all the students are legally there on a homeschooling plan that they work out with their families, but the center provides them a place where they have social connections, where they have weekly classes they can attend, and where they get one-on-one -on -one advising or one-on-one -on -one tutoring with a whole variety of uh, paid staff, but also volunteers, a lot of college students who are doing work study and community members, parents. Um, so it's a really vibrant place where um, students are empowered to choose what they want to learn and pursue that. And, and a lot of, while there are some lifelong homeschoolers that are attend, um, there's quite a few students, the majority certainly, who probably would never think of having a life like this, but the center makes it possible for them. So when I started teaching there, it was a very unique experience for me. Um, very exciting to be uh, working with teens again, because I, I had been away from teaching for a few years. And um, when I came in, I was also thinking, wow, you know, I have this whole restorative practices part of my life that uh, I'm really interested in and, and won't this be a great opportunity to also work with that. So when I, when I came into the setting, the first thing I did was just observe. Uh, I just um, took stock of what was going on. Um, I saw uh, different one-on-one -on -one activities. I saw different classes. I saw different ways of responding you know, if a kid misbehaved or, or if something happened, how do we deal with this? Um, and I saw a community meeting that happened once a week. This is an image of, of that, for example. And I really took account of just what was happening. I, I, I wasn't ready to kind of butt in and put my, uh, uh, I, my ideas in yet. I really wanted to understand what it was about. And, and you know, I came away feeling like, wow, this is a really restorative place. Um, you know, students have a lot of voice to do what they want to do. Uh, they can ask for classes. They can even create classes. Um, when things went wrong, it was handled pretty nicely. There wasn't really discipline or suspensions or of anything of that sort. But, you know, people would come together and talk and try to work it out. I even saw some circles. Um, and... Um, and so, you know, I felt like, well, you know, there's definitely some restorative elements here. Uh, about concurrent at this time, I started taking classes at the IRP Graduate School as well. And each of those classes sort of challenged me uh, from the very first RP 500 to, you know, look at my setting and think, all right, well, what could I do? What's, what's something I can do? So one of the things uh, I kind of came upon was this community meeting where uh, it happened every week, but it was in a format where it felt like the teachers and the staff were talking to students. It was more like a very conventional meeting, not so much like a circle. And I thought, well, first of all, are people really happy with this format? Because we would have a problem like, who's going to wash the dishes? And it, yeah, all the kids would be talking out of turn. And, and uh, you know, it was everybody was like exhausted. We have to talk about this again. I'm thinking, wait a minute, this this shouldn't be working this way. So I asked the staff, you know, how do you guys feel about this meeting because to me it's feeling like it's more to the students which doesn't feel very much in tune with this whole center and not very much with them and it turned out that the other staff was not that happy with the format of the meeting either they wanted to have the meeting they felt it was important uh, especially at a place like this where students are really on their own and doing their own programs of living and learning that they have a place to come together and see themselves as a group, but they were really open to trying a different way. So um, I teamed up with um, a, a, another staff member, particularly who's also interested in 
issue of community building. And we started a variety of things during the community meeting. So you see it really as a circle here. Um, we did activities of just go arounds, you know, typical community building, you know, who are you? What books do you like? What are you learning about? What are you excited about? Um, and then we introduced the dinosaur, which was our talking piece. And we would pass this dinosaur around and, you know, sometimes we'd start to get into, well, you know, what, you know, we have a sense that maybe there's some issue about too much noise in the common room. You know, people, how are people feeling about that? What do you think could be done about that? And so sort of subtle ways of building community, uh, you know, it's kind of a cross between the proactive and the responsive. We're responding to a sense that there might be a problem. Um, and then, you know, then we had this dinosaur when we, when we did have a problem and it was so great. I remember there was an incident where um, some stealing was happening and, you know, we just said to the group, you know, we were aware some people have gotten some things stolen. How do you feel about that? And everybody went around and I, I'll never forget one of the newest kids um, who'd only been there for a few days took it and said, you know, I, this just feels so much like the school I used to go to. And I, I just thought North Star was a different place and, and that, that, that things like this wouldn't happen here. It was so interesting just to see how these students were really starting to affirm the kind of community that they wanted. And um, so I, I felt really good over a few years to be able to implement a different process in these meetings. And, and it was nice that it was really welcomed by the other staff. Uh, I'm gonna switch slides here. Um, so this is not a mentoring session, but as I looked at this photo, uh, I realized that many of the students with the band, in fact, I think all the students in this picture were students that I did have a one-on-one -on -one advisory relationship with during my time teaching at North Star. Um, so I think it's a great example. Um, one of the other roles I had was to do one-on-one -on -one advising with, um, with students and for once a week, and it was a really great experience. Um, and what I found was, again, in concurrence with some of my courses, I was really able to work on how I did that advising. So I, I, I can't remember exactly what course it was, but uh, I, I did a process where I went and interviewed all the staff. I think there were seven other staff who were doing advising and took notes and said, all right, so tell me about this advising. What do you do? What don't you do? How's it supposed to work? And kind of pulled together, uh, gleaned so much information and knowledge from them and then was able to develop my own style. And it was really interesting because there are so many ways to do that that is consistent with what felt like really, what I would say, restorative, you know, really um, respectful of students, um, you know, challenge, challenging them in the sense of, you know, this is what I see, you know, not in a negative way, but giving kids honest feedback. Uh, and supporting them. One of the courses I took at the graduate school dealt with narrative therapy. That was really exciting. I, I got to do um, sort of a, a case study with a student, um, worked through a series of sessions with him, which was, was really fascinating um, to do. And um, it was just a whole other area where I got to, got to develop my skills and use kind of this restorative learning framework. All right, so another area when things go wrong, of course, you know, things happen everywhere. There's no perfect setting. Uh, somebody's gonna be upset about something or break the rules or cross a line or be seen to cross a line. And again, uh, this, uh, the director of North Star, Ken Danford, one of my favorite people in the world, is talking to some students here. And, um, and he, he really set a good tone with that in general, even before I came. But I found that one of the things we could discuss is, you know, we had good communication among staff. We met regularly in a basically a circle format, very collegial uh, format. And, you know, things would go wrong. And sometimes you had to call somebody's parents, you know, like they just crossed too much of a boundary. It could have been with drugs and alcohol at the, at the facility or, or if there was a fight, you know, very occasionally, or, you know, just repeated like, you know, you're just not respecting the norms, people's space, and so on. So 
um, that would be a case where a, kid, a student might have to go home and, and come back for a meeting with their parents. But I think one of the things we got really good at is just being clear, like including parents can be a really positive thing. Um, you know, you don't, you don't want to go around students a lot of times, we felt we would like to deal with things directly with students, but sometimes, you know, and so developing kind of clear, like trust the process. Okay, no, in that circumstance, we call the parents, we do this, we do this, we have this meeting, then we have this meeting, we have a meeting with the student and the adults, then if there were two students involved, we bring them together. And I felt like um, there was an ability to help clarify that process. And finally, this was sort of a, a case that I took after I actually left North Star last June. Uh, last October, I presented at an IRP World Conference. I uh, decided my topic would be, um, oh, uh, essentially, you know, what, what, what are the best restorative practices? What, I decided just to pull some of the best restorative practices I know in the IRP and outside of the IRP, call them up, have conversations and say, you know, what am I missing? What is advanced restorative practices? What, what, uh, what should this really look like? And out of doing this process, basically for myself and to do my presentation, I came down to the fact that one-on-one -on -one communication is probably the most essential restorative practices there is. Uh, and, and I was finding myself talking to staff and saying, you know, you have a problem with that kid? Just go talk to them. Pull them and, and talk to them outside the context of being around other kids. Because if you address a student in front of their friends and peers, it's not always going to go the best. Uh, and I think we're all that way. You know, if we're feeling put on the spot, um, we don't all, we're not always able to be vulnerable and accept what we've done. And, and so um, anyway, I just give that as another sort of example of how I feel like I've internalized those professional learning practices that I gained partly through studying restorative practices. And I think, I think we all can really apply those things constantly in our work if we take that time to reflect on what are my problems? How could I attack that? What steps, what colleagues could I talk to and treat our professional life as a learning experience? Okay, well, that concludes uh, my particular presentation. Um, so if you are joining late, uh, Welcome. Um, please feel free to go to the chat room and let us know where you're from. If you have questions for the hosts, we will be taking questions a little bit later. Um, you can use the question and answer area for that, and you can look at those questions and upvote them if you'd like, uh, so we'll know what you're interested in hearing about. Um, I would like to say that if you're interested in the graduate school, summer registration is open. You can learn about that on the website. The deadline is May 20th. One of the courses that is being offered this summer is RP 525, Restorative Practices in Action. It is a very practical course uh, where you address the kind of things that we're talking about today. A problem in your professional area, you have a support group of students and the faculty, and you develop a plan and you, you see it through, and along the way, you have this group to give you advice and input as you go. All right, so I would invite you, if you have a question, a problem in your professional area that you can think of that kind of relates to this conversation, to use the chat room and let us know. Uh, our our co-host, Ben Wachtel, is behind the scenes. He'll be monitoring those and give us a little bit of a report um, after the next presentation. So at this point, I would like to invite our Director of Student Services, Jamie Cates, to talk about a project that she instituted recently during her experience in RP 525, Restorative Practices in Action. Go ahead, Jamie. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Keynes. I'm the Director of Student Services. I have been with the IIRP since July of 2012. And I came from, my history is very much corporate uh, in corporate backgrounds, um, big business, top down, um, 
supervisors that told you what to do. You were surprised when you had feedback because it was once a year in an evaluation. Um, voices were not encouraged. We were very much uh, more pawns in the experiences that I've had. So coming to IIRP was a breath of fresh air. It was a little unnerving. My first experience, my very first day, was attending the Restorative Leadership Development event. I didn't know what restorative practices was. I walked into a room with 45 chairs, a globe on a chair, and people coming up and greeting me, and I thought, oh boy, what did I get into? But I found myself over those days really nodding and saying, yeah, this really makes sense to me. I didn't know what restorative practices was. I didn't know it was a thing in and of itself, but it just made sense. So I, I really quickly um, just committed myself to the work. I learned a lot in my time. I'm learning every day in, at my time at IIRP. I started, I was an adult learner, so I graduated with my undergraduate degree in 2016. I started my graduate work the same year, that fall, and it was in 2018 when I enrolled in the RP525 Restorative Practices in Action course. By that time, I had, you know, six years at the IIRP. Um, I had a lot of experience because I lived and breathed restorative practices every day. I had experiences facing problems, dealing with conflict, identifying gaps, recommending changes. I found my voice. It was still small, but I found it. I started to find it more and more every day. I learned how to give and receive feedback. So pretty much everything you probably would expect from living and working in a restorative environment, I thought I really had a good handle on it. But what the experience in the 525 course taught me was how to be more of an active participant and be a more intentional leader and recognize the changes that I needed to make in my approaches and my behavior. So I had to identify a problem. Josh already talked a little bit about that. I identified a problem that I had to work on, that I wanted to work on. And at the same time, organizationally, we were starting to recognize that from a student services perspective and a customer support perspective, our service and our support for our clients and our, our students wasn't really what we wanted it to be. We found that our students were getting transferred from person to person. There were questions that were answered that were unclear and that it created more questions. So nobody was doing anything wrong, but we wanted to do it better. So I was asked to undertake that experience and, and lead that charge. So I chose that as my project in the 525 course. It was great. I had, it was really easy for me to come up with ideas and ways to make things better. And I had ideas of what needed to change. That was the easy part. <laughs> the hard part was keeping the people and my colleagues with me in the experience. It wasn't that I didn't want to include people. It just, it wasn't my natural go-to to do that. And I really had to look at my own actions and my own behaviors. I made a lot of mistakes while I was working through that project. I included some people, I didn't include other people. I engaged some in part of the conversation, but not all of the conversation. And what I realized coming out of the course is I spent a lot of time learning, exploring, and living what it meant to use fair process. So how do you engage people in conversations? How do you come back with an explanation? And then how do you set clear expectations? So I really had to take a look at what I was doing and how I was communicating. I got a lot of feedback during the 10 weeks of the course from my colleagues, and some of it was tough. It was tough to hear because I realized that I was, I was falling short and I was missing the mark. But I really appreciated the feedback that I got from my colleagues. But what was really great about it was every night I would go back to my computer and I could download what worked and what didn't work that day. And I had the support of other students. I'm not in traditional education. I'm not in a K through 12 school. I work with adult students and I work with adult colleagues. So my, my experience and my needs were different, 
but the feedback and the support that I got from the students in my class was incredible. I learned so much. I grew so much. The ideas were universal. They translated across professions and across work environments. And I really valued the experience and I made some really, really great relationships within the course itself. And at the end of the 10 weeks, what I realized, the work didn't end. Just because the course ended, the work itself didn't end. I'm a year and a half out of the course and the colleagues, the group of people that you know we brought together as a team to support our students and support our customers in a, in a stronger way, the team structures changed. People have joined us, people have left, people's responsibilities have changed. But at the end of the day, the team um, experience and the team spirit is strong. And I see the group getting together. We were getting together on a daily basis until COVID happened. <laughs> so now we connect virtually, but they check in with each other. They celebrate victories with each other. They offer support to each other. They you know, ask for help if they need it. So it's it's been a really great experience to see how well um, it, I was able to help support that, those efforts. And it wasn't me. It was me leading, but it was encouraging other people to find their voice. It was encouraging other people to give and receive feedback and build their own skills. And what was really interesting is a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to oversee a, a different project. And I met with this person, I met with that person, I met with a, this group or that group. And it was only about two weeks into those conversations, I said, wait a minute, this is starting to feel very, very familiar to me. Let's bring everybody together. Let's bring everybody into the conversation. Let's talk about what are the challenges? What is the problem? What are we trying to solve? Who has what strengths? Who has what interest? What concerns are we bringing to the table? And I felt really proud of myself at that moment that I was able to recognize that the experience in 525 was relevant right here and it only took me two weeks to get there instead of 12 weeks last time so it was you know i was able to bring the, the group together a lot more quickly and we were able to get to the the project itself that we needed to address in a much faster way and you know i really learned about um, being intentional, but I, I think the most important thing that I learned in 525 that I model for my colleagues now is humility. And the fact that my being humble, my owning, being comfortable, it's hard, but owning when I make mistakes and calling myself out on those mistakes and asking for help, asking for support, asking for feedback has really been critical in building and developing relationships with other people and I'm modeling it so other people can do the same. So that's my experience. Josh? Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, so I, I, we're getting a lot of questions. I appreciate those. Please keep them coming in the question to answer window. Uh, we'll try to take them a little bit later. But there was one question that a few people asked that I just thought maybe um, uh, Beth, difference between restorative practices and restorative justice. Can you just take that quick for those who maybe aren't as familiar with that context? Yeah, um, in some cases there isn't a difference depending on I think who you're talking to. Um, but what I see as um, a distinction between the two is that restorative justice really came from the criminal justice system as a response to wrongdoing, as a response to harm, where restorative practices includes the response to, uh, to wrong and to, um, and to harm, but it also includes a whole series of proactive options uh, to build community and capacity so that when things go wrong, you can respond. Great. Well, I think that's a really good segue to your segment, Beth, because you, you came in working in Community Service Foundation and Bucksmont Academies, which were both the model programs of the IRP, which work more with adjudicated youth and other youth who are really struggling in different ways. Um, so why don't you just start from there? Um, what was your work and how did you view um, as restorative developed and your understanding developed, how did you see your professional learning environment through a restorative lens? 
Yeah, so I started working at a Community Service Foundation 18 years ago as a drug and alcohol counselor. So it was our, the restorative environment was already there, right? So um, that made it really easy. And one of the things I think this is across organizations, whether it's Community Service Foundation, Boxman Academy, or IIRP, uh, that we really look at things through um, a lens of learning communities, right? How do we, again, build connection and community? So as a counselor on a team there, and then and eventually became a supervisor of a clinical team, one of the things we did to really enhance our learning was monthly team builders. And that's something, again, that happens across the organizations. Uh, building a community proactively really helps to create a positive learning environment. And even now in this kind of new world we're living in, we're doing that, but we're doing it virtually, right? So how do we still have an opportunity to build connection? The other important piece of that was facilitation was shared across the team. So it wasn't just the supervisor or the leader who was responsible for these team building um, activities. We would play games uh, sometimes. We would always have food. That was always very important um, to us. And we'd be really creative uh, with our menus. Uh, we spent a lot of time on that. Uh, for example, in January in Pennsylvania, when it was freezing outside, we would have a summer picnic um, as a way to lift our spirits through the cold. Um, and we, we engaged in activities uh, that were really across all risk levels. So if we had newer staff, um, we would start a little low, low risk and then continue to build ourselves up, right? Because we wanted to really build community and relationships with one another to enhance our learning environment. The next uh, piece that we did on our team was we had monthly staff meetings, which is not um, very groundbreaking. I'm sure many of you out there have uh, staff meetings, uh, but we tried to approach it again from a different lens. Uh, we always ran them in circles, uh, which again, I don't know that that's completely groundbreaking to some of the folks on the call who probably are doing that anyway, uh, but we started with check-ins and just had a sense of where folks were at. We would engage in learning activities in our staff meetings. So whether it was a, a concept we were working on, affective statements, uh, running circles, uh, or so it could be restorative concepts that we were learning at the IIRP, or even things that came out um, from other places, right? So we talked a lot about motivational interviewing, especially on a, a counseling team. Um, and the last thing that we would do at every staff meeting would, it was engaging in what we would call restorative problem solving. And if any of you have been to any of our events, you may have experienced this. And it's it's really just a very structured way to get feedback. So as clinicians who were working with kids, primarily who were involved in the juvenile justice system, who were struggling with some uh, drug and alcohol issues or family issues or trauma, um, we would do this uh, process as a way to present cases. So I would spend three minutes talking about the case I was working on and where I was needing some support. And then my team for 10 minutes would give me feedback. And I couldn't respond. I just had to sit there and listen. And then at the very end, I could respond back on what it is that I was gonna do. So it really helped to structure the problem and it took away the back and forth that often happens when you're sitting around in, in the office uh, you know, talking about a struggle. And then because we were an intact team, when we would come back for the next staff meeting, I could say, so I tried these three things with this family and this worked really well, um, but this didn't. So you know, now I wanna have an opportunity to, to rephrase that problem. So one more uh, piece I want to just highlight is an implementation uh, that we did, and this is more of my time at IIRP in conjunction with CSF and Buxmont. So we worked together to create um, a motivational interviewing implementation in the schools as well as the counseling programs. And this was something that spanned over three years and still continues. And um, it was, again, a shared effort between all of our organizations. And we didn't, as Jamie said, I kind of just want to highlight on the making mistakes and humility. We did a lot of things wrong when we started. Uh, we didn't always engage the right people or we weren't giving uh, the best expectation clarity um, around certain ideas. So we would come back to the table every year and say, so where are we going wrong? What do we need to improve on? What's working? So I think that constant feedback loop is also really helpful in uh, a learning organization, a learning community. Uh, we started this implementation with a, a professional development and then identified coaches, had on-site consultation. So this was really, again, not so much as ex experts coming in, but how do we build capacity on individual teams to help strengthen um, 
their own capacity and sustainability. So every site had a, has a coach and still does have coaches. Uh, they, we created lesson plans for monthly professional learning communities. So again, the, the structure is really important um, to make sure that you're following through with this, whether again, it's in a staff meeting, a team builder, or in a professional learning community uh, specific to a particular topic. And um, lastly, at the, at the end of this three-year implementation, every leader in all of the sites, whether it was our school sites or our counseling sites, all presented an implementation plan. So what was gonna be unique for their site and how are they gonna continue this implementation? And we used the same problem solving process where they presented uh, their, uh, pro or their plan, got feedback, and then responded back on what it was they were gonna do. So I think in any uh, learning community, when we're looking at this through a restorative lens, first and foremost, build community and relationships. That's what, uh, that's what our focus is. And building that social capital really does allow for a positive uh, experience. And the other thing I would say is just really be consistent uh, with what the process looks like and um, continuing to have that move from uh, month to month. So thanks, Josh. All right. Thanks so much, Beth. So we, we have had a few people um, post in some of the issues that they're dealing with. And I guess I just would like to take a few questions at this point. Um, so uh, one question was around buy-in from staff. I, I mean, I think the three of us sort of working in different settings where we already have a good relationship among colleagues, but I wonder if, and maybe Beth, you would be best to take this. So what kind of things do you say to folks who are trying to develop their restorative practice, but they recognize they want to get more support from their colleagues? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and that uh, that does come up often. Um, I think it's finding some uh, some folks will call them champions or uh, people who will uh, support you. So if I'm, you know, kind of going at this alone, who are my peers in my community uh, that I'm already connected with, and starting there. So again, I think if we continue to to build relationships, whether it's one on one, it starts to uh, spread out. Uh, and, and before you know it, and I've seen it in a lot of different settings, uh, people want to know what's happening over there, <laughs> you know, what's happening with that uh, group, because they're getting a lot of really positive results. So uh, find your allies um, and the people who have similar interests. Uh, and then, you know, you can kind of move from there. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would like to chime in a little bit, because I think there was a question regarding setting norms during staff meetings. Um, and, and I agree. I think bringing up issues, just talking to staff uh, as a group and one-on-one -on -one say, you know, I, I see some maybe better ways we could do this. Is everybody satisfied with the way we do our meetings? Does anybody have any ideas for maybe making this more engaging? What do we want to get out of these meetings? I, I found that sometimes when you ask those direct questions of people, it gives them a chance. It's like using the idea of restorative questions and not off a card, but using the idea to challenge people, not like you know the answer, because that is really helpful for getting buy-in when you give people a chance. Are you happy with the way things going? What would you like to see different? What do you think could be better? Jamie, you're nodding like maybe you have something to add. I do. You and I have had this conversation too. It's, you know, I, I get that question a lot from folks that call about professional development events or grad school. And my answer is always, it's not a manual, right? So when you're trying to get staff to buy in, I think sometimes it's the idea of, I'm going to implement restorative practices. How do I get my staff to, to join me? When in reality, it can be as simple as changing, like Josh was saying and Beth was saying, changing what you're doing. And you don't have to necessarily label it as restorative practices. You can change the way you're running your meeting. You can have team builders. You know, you can start doing that. You can start um, just going around and having one-on-one. -on -one. I saw a question pop up about fair process. You know, one of the things that I did when I was working on my project I went to people individually. Josh, you said this too, Beth, all three of us did. We went and we talked to individuals, what's working and what's not, and really assessing the climate and the challenges and then coming together to say, okay, this is what I'm hearing now, how are we going to address it? So it, I don't think it needs to be a, this overarching, 
we're going to do restorative practices, but it's really about what you're doing and how you're approaching the, the conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, there's a number of questions also about, you know, how do you, how do you start with students or if they're resistant, uh, how can I work with inmates? Um, I feel like it's looking for an opportunity to have a conversation, a different kind of conversation, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a group. Um, so for me with students, it was saying, okay, you know what, today we're gonna just go around and talk about a movie that, that each person loves and we're gonna make a chart and we're gonna put it on the wall. Um, we don't say, oh, we're having a restorative conversation. We just do it. And I found with students, a great way is to break it up and to do different activities. So it's, they can't guess what you're going to do next. And when you do it again, it's, it's a pleasant return rather than, oh, are we doing that again? But, you know, it could be the same way. I haven't worked in prisons with inmates, so I don't know. But I would think that you know, challenging them, you know, asking something that feels a little outside of even your comfort zone. Like, is this going to work? Try it. Worst that can happen is the circle is a flop or you're like, yeah, all right, I'll do it different next time. Beth, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's interesting as you were all talking about getting people bought in. Um, and this is a, an example that is kind of happening now as we're in this virtual world, but a friend of mine who also works for CSF Bucksmont, um, they started moving their their groups online uh, for the students. And there was a, a, a new student who came in to the school after uh, COVID-19 <laughs> happened. Uh, so now we're trying to you know, engage someone online um, in a new process. So, you know, my friend did some one-on-one -on -one conversations with her, uh, but she was very hesitant to join a Zoom call with 12 students that she had never met before. Uh, so, you know, first it was just one-on-one -on -one with the counselor. Then the next step was, well, uh, how about, would you be willing to meet with like two people from the group just to get connected and get started? So that was the next step, right? So just widening that circle. And then, you know, after a couple of weeks of one-on-one -on -one to small groups, she was able to join the circle and felt comfortable. And this was all now in the virtual world. And I think it becomes, um, it's how are we engaging? So again, the same uh, friend of mine, you know, let's say there was 15 students that were supposed to come on to the, uh, to the, counseling session or the, the group session and 12 of them came instead of saying like wow that's amazing we got 12 kids to come on uh the conversation is all right how do we get those other three involved and how do we engage them right so sometimes i think you are starting from that one-on-one -on -one level and then making um creating the circle a little bit bigger every time all right well, it's so great that we've had so much participation, so many great questions. I know there were an awful lot of questions about how to take restorative into the digital environment for teachers. Uh, I see that as really valuable. We're going to need to bookmark that. Uh, we'll figure out how we can get back to you more significantly because I recognize that as a need. Um, Jamie, we have some questions. Can the 525 be taken by people who aren't uh, in the graduate school? Is it fully online? Do you want to just say a word about that? I will. RP 525 is a fully online course. It is running every term. We have a spring, summer, and fall term. Um, if anyone is interested in more information about RP 525, I would encourage you to get in touch with our student services staff. And this, the email is studentservices at iirp.edu, so nice and easy. Um, the registration deadline date for the summer course is coming up. It's May 20th at 1 p.m. There's still time to register for that course. Okay, and we have a fully online course with no prerequisites. That one has uh, some minor prerequisite with the basic training the first two days, but RP 506 Restorative Practices, the Promise and the Challenge is fully online. Beth, you're the teacher for that. Would you just say a word? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's a fully online course. And what we do over those 10 weeks is explore uh, the promise and the challenge of restorative practices in a variety of settings. So the restorative practices has a lot of promise, um, but there's also gaps and challenges. So I, I think it's important for us not to just can think of this as a magic wand. And if you just implement restorative practices, everything's going to be wonderful and great. There are challenges and there's some barriers and we need to explore those as well. 
All right, I'm going to take one final question about fair process, because in a way, I think that is really an overarching theme here. How do you convince people, adults, how do you work fair process with people? Um, Jamie, I'm going to give it to you first. <laughs> You just do it. It's, it's in your approach as the person who's familiar with it. Remember, there's three phases. I think um, it's, again, having those individual conversations. Josh, you talked about direct communication. It really boils down to being honest, being open, and being real about asking for people's uh, feedback and their opinions. Um, you know, it is ultimately somebody has to make a decision. So when there's a decision that has to be made, I'll be honest, that's an area that I really struggled with. At what point do I stop taking everybody's feedback and go to the decision making? And then I come back with the ex explanation. The expectation clarity is just making sure that people understand, okay, this is a decision. I took everybody's feedback. This is a decision that was made and this is what it looks like going forward and making sure that people have a clear understanding of what the expectations are of them individually but it really i can't emphasize it enough it really starts with you or me or the individual that is working with the other people beth i'm going to give you the last word on that yeah so first uh, teach people what fair process is so they have an understanding of what's happening um, and just to reiterate what Jamie said follow through all three phases and when you're not doing it catch yourself and take responsibility for it uh, there's been plenty of times uh, in many roles where I have not used fair process or I haven't explained in the correct way or uh, used expectation clarity or I've just made the decision because I was thought it was the best decision. Um, so my, my walk back to the with box always starts with humility and that's um, also includes fair process. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody once again who joined us. Uh, this has been really fun conversation with uh, Beth and Jamie, thank you so much. Thanks to Steve Grieger and Ben Wachtel behind the scenes making this work. And again, thanks to all of you. We will have a recording of this. We'll be following up with some email. Also, this has been going on Facebook Live. So if you wanna continue the conversation on Facebook, you'll find people chatting on that post. So again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again. Take care.